welcome you guys online and in the church. How you guys doing? You guys doing good? Amen. You guys ready to worship the Lord? Amen. Father, we thank you for who you are today, God. We thank you for everything that you've done for us, Lord. God, let us worship in freedom, Lord God, and enjoy, Lord God, uh, the, the joy that you've given us, Father. And we just give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's worship together.
tonight, let's raise a hallelujah in the house. Amen. Once again, thanks for joining us live. Thanks for joining us at home. I'm telling you, it feels a whole lot better in here right now. It was hot this morning, but it's starting to cool down. But you know, I started thinking about this uh, in Habakkuk. Habakkuk, it's a hymn of faith. It says, though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Yet, everybody say yet. Come on at home, I want to hear you say yet. 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 I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet, and he will make me walk on my high heels. I thought that was real. Not high heels, not pumps, ladies, but on the high heels. You ever, ever see those high heels? You ever see those slopes on those hills? Isn't it amazing how you can see the, the cattle and you can see those deer? They're just walking like nothing. Their, their step is sure in Christ, in God. That's how God made them. That's, that's what he plans for us. I'll get it out. That's what he's planned for us, that when we come to him and when we live our life in him, that he makes our feet sure on any mountain that we're climbing. Amen? Any obstacle that's in our way, we're, we're secure in step with the will of God. I just want to pray for us as we get started this morning. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you that we rejoice in our circumstances. We rejoice in, in the storms of life. We rejoice no matter what life is offering. And during this time, during this uh, the, the last few days as we enter into election time, thank you for securing us that our faith is in Christ Jesus, not in a political system, not in a specific man, or not in a king, but it's in King Jesus we're secured this morning. And so we come and we worship. We offer uh, sacrifices of praise. We offer our hearts in worship, and we abandon everything of the world, and we set our mind on things above. Come on, let's begin to worship him with our heart. Just tell him right now, Lord, we worship you. We worship you from my heart. God, I want to just say that my heart is yours. I surrender everything in myself to you. I give over my will to you this morning. I want your way to be my way today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing. And I've tried so hard to see it. It took me so long to believe it That you choose someone like me To carry your victory Perfection could never earn it You give what we don't deserve it you take the broken things and raise them to glory. You are my champion, and giants fall when you stand undefeated. Every battle you won, and I am who you say. And you've crowned me with confidence, I am seated in the heavenly place, undefeated by the one who has conquered it all. Yeah. 
When I lift my voice in shout, every wall comes crashing down. I have the authority that Jesus has given me. When I open up my mouth, miracles start breaking out. I have the authority that Jesus has given me. When I lift my voice and shout, every wall comes crashing You are my champion. You are my champion. Giants fall when you stand undefeated. Every battle you've won. See, I am who you say I am. You've crowned me with confidence. I in the heavenly place undefeated by the one who has conquered it all.
deserve So we surrender Oh, we surrender Come on, just surrender to Him this morning Just close your eyes, just focus on Him surrender all to you. We surrender. God, I lay my burdens down. Oh, we lay our burdens down. Oh, we pick up your righteousness. Lord, we surrender our hearts this morning. Yes, you give the Lord a hand clap this morning. Thank you. You know, I just was thinking about why is that important? Why is this important that we surrender all? And I, and I was thinking that my devotion to God right now, think about this. Think about where you're at right here with the Lord. But my devotion to God in the past does not guarantee my devotion to God today. Huh? Think about that. Some of us maybe let things into our life that block our dependence on God, and we start doing things in our own strength, strength, where yesterday we were totally dependent on Him because we were in a difficult situation, and maybe now that things have gotten a little bit better for us, now that the there's a, the band is kind of lifting, you know, things are opening up a little bit more, and, oh yeah, I, I got this, I got this. But let's remember, God's got you. <laughs> He's got you. He has you. He's going to never leave you or let you down. But I wanted to bring a couple of things to light this morning that there's some consequences that we really need to be aware of. And I want to pray for you in just a
just a minute. But when we begin to rely on our own strength, when we begin to do things our own way, it restricts God's blessings from, from coming into our life. So why not just yield our hearts to Him? Why not just start there at the beginning? God, whatever I'm doing right now, I'm in your will. God, I want to be right now at the forefront of your will. Not my will, but your will. And when you do that, God's blessings will come. You know, I think a lot of times when we get into our will, we our own will, we just reject the instruction of the Lord, the word of God. We start getting back into our old ways, our old way of thinking. You know, maybe even doubts, anxiety, and worry start to overwhelm us. That's not our new self. That was our old self. Our new self is trusting in God, having faith in God, believing for God for a miracle, even when the miracle's not at your fingertips. That's trusting in God. That's relying on His Word. Let's not reject the instruction of the Lord. Let's not reject the Word of God. But how about this? Let's not refuse God's help. Let's not refuse God's help right now. God wants to help us. He wants to take the reins. He wants to lead the way. Let's not push his hand away. Let's welcome his hand into our life. Amen. If you just bow our heads, if you right now are facing something huge, something big, something that just seems like there's there's no way for it to, to change, God wants to come to your rescue today, and he wants to encourage you. Listen, if you just surrender this over to me, I got you. It's going to be okay. So, Father, right now in faith, we take a step of faith. And we release ourselves into your hands. We release this situation into your hands physically, mentally, spiritually, whatever it is. We release it into your hands. Relationally, I, I hear that. A relationship. I release this relationship into your hands, Jesus. I thank you right now, Father, that you're leading and guiding your people. That as they submit to you, as they, they come into your way, they come into your will that they will have this heart of surrender. And I know that you will not disappoint, Lord. You show up in a big way, and you make a, a situation that seems to, to be no way. You make a way. You're the way maker. And this morning, we look to you, Jesus. You're the champion. And we sing of your victory over the lives of your people right here, right now. Thank you for the victory that comes into everybody's life. I pray for those that are sick in body. I pray for those that, are, that are, are discouraged. I pray for those that are depressed. I pray for those that seem to have no hope right now. Lord, that you come and you give them a reminder of who you are and that their future is bright in you. They have a hope and a future in Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for those reminders this morning. You bring us always into victory. You bring us out of the misery of our hearts, the misery of our minds, the misery of the condition of our life, and you bring new things into us for our good. Thank you, God, for making life new again. In Jesus' name. I'm so glad that God wants all of us, not just part of you. He wants all of you. Everything, everything you are, everything that makes up you, he wants all of that. And sometimes I think, why do you want all of us, God? Because he wants to give you, he wants us to give him us so he can give us better things newer things, not stuck in the old, stuck in the past. And there's a scripture in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone, a new life has begun. And he's a God of the new, he's not a God of the old, a God of the past, he's a God of the now and the new. So as we give him, uh, as we give ourselves up to him, he will fill us with the new and what he wants us to have. Man, it's a new day for you. I love the Bible, it's, it's so true, it's so real, that His mercies are new every morning. And we used to sing a song, that He runs after you, He runs and pursues your heart. So will you remind your family this morning, your friends, will you turn to somebody and say, God's mercy is new every morning, and He's running after you. Tell them, encourage them, God's mercy is new every morning, and He's running after you, because He loves you. Amen. Well, you may be seated out in the congregation. You might be still seated at home. But we want to say we're going to continue to bring the services to you live at 11 a.m. Uh, we have a nice crowd in the morning. I think people are just liking getting out early. I don't know. They want to get out. They want to go. I was making making a little joke this morning 
that, that they, it's nice to come to church at 9 because they get to beat the Baptists and now the Catholics. They get to beat, beat them all. <laughs> to, my wife's like, don't say that. <laughs> they get to go beat them to the lunch line. That's all. They beat them to the menudo. There's still menudo at 10 o'clock, 1030 at the restaurants. If you get out at, at noon, it let, listen, good luck trying to find some menudo out there. But anyway, I'm still talking about menudo. Yes, I eat menudo. Yes, I do like it, and uh, my wife doesn't like all of it, but I like all of it, and I will find some maybe today. I'll find some, but uh, God's good, and uh, he's always providing for us, even those nice little treats that we consider treats, um, and I, I'm grateful that we have a testimony to give in the provision of the Lord. Amen? I want you to have a testimony and to speak, speak Speak it out loud. God has provided for my family and I. Even, even when you're just believing by faith. Do you hear that? Even if you're believing, God has provided for my family and I. He is making a way and he is providing every step of the way. We have that running, you know, it's not really a joke. It's just something that we remind ourselves. The Lord will provide. And God has come through big time for our family in times of need. And he's coming through for each one of you still today still today it's not a one-time thing in jesus isn't that awesome it's not a one-time thing in jesus this is a constant thing when we walk in relationship with him jehovah jireh he's our provider we don't seek after the ben franklins the thomas jeffersons or the george washingtons i guess we hey the, every dollar counts right yeah. listen we, we don't seek after that to find joy or happiness we seek god and his, his heart for us is that he brings us into what we need. And I just, I'm just encouraging you right now at home. We're going to take an offering and just be blessed of the Lord that God is going to provide for you a way to make it through every circumstance. When people lose their jobs, hey, you will have favor and you'll keep your job. Maybe you'll get a promotion. Maybe the, the workload will be a little bit more, but God will give you strength to endure. God will help you through. And guess what? You won't lack. You won't lack when the rest of the world is lacking. You won't lack. God will make a way for you. So that's the miracle I'm praying over you. So right now, Father, as we get ready to give, and we, we get ready to sow seed into your kingdom, to, to give in accordance to your word, to worship you with the resources that we have, to further your kingdom. Your kingdom come through New Hope Family Church, and your will be done through the finances of your people, the resources that you've given them. Help us as a board, as leadership, to steward uh, the finances, God, that you are bringing in in abundance for the work that you are leading us into in the days to come. We just say thank you for your provision. Thank you for providing above and beyond so that your children can be blessed and then they could be a blessing to someone around them. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can give on givelify.com, givelify.com, or go to nhfcselma.com and you can give by going to that give button and pushing that give button. It just says giving, and you can push on that, and it opens up the giving page. Um, we have buckets here in the church, in the back, and in the front. You can deliver those on your way in on your way out. Amen. Did, uh, you, want to, you have some announcements? I do. A very, a very important one. Good morning, New Hope Family Church, and those of you watching online. It's good to see everybody here this morning, and I believe that you're here for a purpose, not by chance, but for a purpose. So I just want to remind all the ladies also that we have an event coming up on Saturday. It starts at 9. But if you want a little coffee and a little pastry, come at 845. So 15 minutes early to get your coffee and your pastry. And if you have not signed up, please, please see Bonnie Quintana. She needs to know how many of us will be coming so she can order the uh, correct amount of lunches for us that day. So it's going to be great. It's going to be a good time. You're going to get a little bit of practical and a little bit of spiritual, and you get to talk to your other sisters in Christ. So sign up for that. And youth also. We are so excited that our youth group of New Hope Family Church gets to meet now on Tuesday evenings at 7 o'clock. Yay. We got, a, we got a yay in the crowd today. So we're so excited. I think any day of the week, any evening of the week is just so amazing for youth. I remember going to youth when I was younger, and it was really life-changing for me. I felt God speak to me. I got ministered to and fed, and um, it's just a great place for all you youth to be. So if you're in junior high or high school, come on out Tuesday night, 7 o'clock remember you at youth group too, babe. Link, wink, wink. <laughs> That's where she said she fell in love with me, right? I mean, hey, I don't know. I'll let her come back up here if she wants to, but 
she was like, oh, you were different than all the other boys, raising your hands, worshiping Jesus. So I remember that, babe, right? Was that true? Okay, it was, it, it's true, I tell you, it's true. That's not a lie. <laughs> so we like to have fun here at New Hope Family Church. It's good to laugh, right? Isn't it good to laugh? It's good to have fun in Jesus, and we love each other, and we believe that God is, is doing what he's, he's doing in, in our lives, even when it's, it's hard. You could find something to laugh about. You know, I just want to make sure that we're staying in joy. Um, we know happiness is fleeting, but you know what? Nothing can rob you of your joy in the Lord. Nothing can rob you of your joy in the Lord. And this, uh, this the last couple months, we're talking about the kingdom of God. And um, I've been wanting to preach in this direction uh, toward the book of Nehemiah, and specifically chapter 3. And we're going to start there today. But just like last week when we moved a little bit differently, I'm going to move a little differently. I feel it's more important as a pastor, as a preacher, that we find something fresh that God's speaking, and uh, we speak as the Holy Spirit's speaking. And so I was going to go through the, the ten gates in Nehemiah chapter 3, but I believe the Lord just stopped me right at the first gate, and I want to read this way in Nehemiah 3. But let me give a little preface for those of you that are just join us, joining us online, or if you're watching the video playback, um, we're going to talk about... Uh, the story of Nehemiah and how Nehemiah, he was a cup bearer in the, in the court of the king. He was kind of a government employee of some sort. He held the cup of the king. So this is interesting about the cup bearer. You know, the cup bearer was a very, very important job. Why was bearing the cup of the king, carrying the cup to the king, such an important job? you know that there were enemies of the king back there? Oh, did you have the answer? Why is it important for us, for the king to have a cupbearer? Did you have the answer? No? Oh, I saw you raising your hand. I thought you had the I was ready. I was ready to hear the answer. You know why it was important for the, for the king to have somebody to carry his cup? So they wouldn't poison him. The king had to have his own cupbearer so that whenever he was thirsty, he needed somebody that he could trust to bring the cup before the king so he could take a drink. Like, I'm going to take a drink right now. So I know that my daughter Victoria brought me this water. I know that I could trust her, that there's no poison in this water. It's refreshing me. Just kidding. I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. <laughs> No, look it. The king had to trust Nehemiah. The king trusted Nehemiah with this great responsibility. So here is a really interesting thing. God showed favor to Nehemiah. God had not only with the job that he had, with the work that he had, God trusted him with something beyond just his job. I hope this speaks to people today by way of what you do as your job in an everyday fashion. What are you, where are you working? What are you doing? Maybe you're a student. Maybe you're going to school. But, but, but this is how God works. God uses you in every season of your life. Do you know that nothing is wasted when you are obedient to God, when you're going the way of God, when you're surrendering your will to God? Do you know that one year is not wasted 2020 is not a wasted year. Oh, I thought I'd hear an amen on that one. I'm, I'm amening myself. A, amen, Pastor. Amen. I want to amen myself. 2020 is not a wasted year. God is going to use this year to bring us into His ways and His purpose. And this was something that Nehemiah experienced as he heard about the the condition of the walls of Jerusalem. They were broken down. They, they, were, they were torn down. In fact, the, the, the city of Jerusalem had been invaded three times by Nebuchadnezzar and the walls. How many of you love a good story? I just love a good story. You know, this is such an amazing story of history. And here were these walls being broken down, invaded by Nebuchadnezzar. Not once, not twice, but three times he came in to rout the city of Jerusalem. So these walls laid in ruin. They were just destructed. And, and so Nehemiah had heard of the condition of his hometown. He 
had heard about the walls being broken and the gates being destroyed, leaving the children of Israel at a disadvantage. How many of you know that if you go to bed with your door open that you can become a target of a, a, a robber or a thief, right? What do you do at night when you, when you go to sleep? You close the door and you lock the door for your protection and your family's protection, right? Is that something that we do? I don't know if there's anybody in here that still sleeps with the door open or unlocked. It's probably because you live in a really safe neighborhood, but chances are you close the door and you lock the door and you put something big in front of the door. I don't know. Maybe some of you might do that, but, but you know what I'm saying? Like there's this thing about the gate. There's protection. There was protection there. And Nehemiah was so moved. He, he, he wept and he cried and God used him as an intercessor to pray and to fast for the destruction of Jerusalem. And so what, what Nehemiah was doing is he was stepping in to God's purpose of ministry. He, God was beginning to move him beyond his job into a purposeful ministry to help rebuild literally the kingdom of God back then. God was taking him and moving him in favor with his king, with the secular king. I think this speaks all over the place to us, this story of Nehemiah. You know, in order to do something important for God, you need his favor on your life. You need the favor of God on your life. And how do you get the favor? You do what Nehemiah did. He went before the Lord and he laid low and he prayed. He prayed and he, he positioned himself to hear from God in fasting. We just went through October 1st through October 21st in a time of fasting and praying for the deliverance of our nation, for the, the intervention, divine intervention of God into the United States of America, into the state of California, into the city of Selma, and the cities that we live in that represent here, are represented right here at New Hope Family Church. What are we doing right now to cry out to God? Are we, are we just laying back? Are we just kind of sitting back like, they deserve it. America, you deserve this. California, you deserve this. Now, look, I understand there's a, a consequence to decisions that we make, choices that we make. There are consequences all the time to the, to the bad choices that we make. Actually, there are, good, there are consequences to good choices, too. But think about this. Nehemiah was positioned in a place where God was going to use him to restore the city of Jerusalem. God gave him the wisdom when he began to put himself down, the flesh down, God gave him a master plan through the time and season of prayer and fasting. How many of us, how many of us are right there right now calling out, oh, I see the condition of our country. Instead of crossing our arms and saying they deserve it, oh, Father, forgive us. Forgive the United States. We humble ourselves. Forgive our forefathers for going astray. Forgive our state for flip-flopping and going in immoral directions. Forgive our city for being so selfish and self-absorbed that now it's in ruins. God, forgive us. How many of us have been moved like that recently? I'm praying that God is doing that. God is coming back and reminding us of our role that we need to play as the church in our city. God needs to remind us of who we are as Christians in our family, as God-fearing men and women of God, and people who trust God, people who look upon God, look to God for everything. That's right now, I believe God's bringing that back and saying, look, I have some people. There's a remnant of people. They're sitting right here in the midst of a pandemic. They're, they're stepping out in faith, and they're coming to encounter the things of God. They want to see the kingdom reestablished in people's lives. I believe that's who you are. Nehemiah was moved by God. God gave him a plan. He rebuilt the walls and the gates of Jerusalem. It took him 52 days. And Nehemiah, he began to name these 12 gates in Nehemiah chapter 3. And I just want to highlight these. I, I started to read this morning in the first service, and it was getting, I mean, I thought I was speaking in tongues. The names are all out there. It's like all these Hebrew names. But I just want to point this out. In verse 1, Eliashib, Eli, Eliashib, Eliashib, Sheb, Shab, Shoal, I don't know, I don't know, <laughs> Eli, Eliashib, the high priest and his fellow priest went to work and rebuilt the Sheb gate. They dedicated it and set its doors in place, building as far as the tower of the hundred, which they dedicated, and as far as the tower of Hananel. 
the men of Jericho built the adjoining section, and Zakur, son of Imri, built next to them. I'm just going to stop there. Now go to the end of that book, the end of chapter 3, and it's verse number 32. And between the room above the corner and the sheep gate, the goldsmiths and merchants made repairs. Just keep this in mind. We're going to go through this passage in the next week or next couple weeks. But these were all of the, the gates here. I'm going to put a little image right up here on the screen. Can you see this? This is what Jerusalem looked like back in Nehemiah's day. And he began to list the, the gates. Did we get that up? He began to list the gates. And it's from counterclockwise. He starts with the sheep gate. In verse 1, he goes to the fish gate. Verse 3, old the old gate in verse 6. The valley gate in verse 13. The dung gate in verse uh, 13 goes to the fountain gate in verse 15. He goes to the water gate in verse 26. The horse gate in verse 28. The east gate in verse 29. And the inspection gate in verse 31. There are 12 gates around Jerusalem, but he begins with these 10 gates, and he lists them out. And I, and I want to point out here that, that he is describing, again, the activity and what happened. He was going back in to repair. And as we begin to look to see why was it important that he repair the walls and specifically the gates of Jerusalem. And I, I have a definition of what a gate is. A gate as a movable structure controlling entrance or exit through an opening in a fence or wall or any means of entrance. So the restoring of the gates was necessary in rebuilding the walls and securing the city of Jerusalem. So a little bit of background with the story, whenever God set Nehemiah on the course of doing this, oh, maybe, is was that Nehemiah raising his hand? I can't see back there. Was that Nehemiah? That's why, okay. Hey, think, think about this story. This is a Bible story with your name in it. I just, it just hit me. So, um, <laughs> but, but think about this. The, the background information in chapter 3, that whenever God called Nehemiah to do something, he he moved him. God moved him to do it, but he, it didn't come without resistance. It didn't come without opposition. And you go back and watch the Wednesday night video on Facebook if, if you want to hear a little bit more about that. But God was, God was moving. God was moving Nehemiah in the direction to help rebuild, but he didn't do it by himself. God gave him this master plan. He needed help. He needed people to take part to rebuild the walls. And he, in verse uh, excuse me, in chapter 2, you're going to see Nehemiah challenge the people to rise up and build in the middle of this opposition, even though they were being opposed. He said, come on, we have a job to do. We're commissioned of the Lord, and nothing is going to stop us. No governor can say, hey, you can't gather, you can't worship. Listen, God has called us together to worship. Right now, Pastor Mike McClure up in San Jose is being sued by the city of Santa Clara. $350,000 that fine has reached right now. That fine has climbed because the city of Santa Clara says, hey, you can't meet with 600 people in your church. That's too many. Pastor Mike says, look, I have too many people with mental issues right now. They have been uh, uh, just overtaken by the, the pandemic and the, the life that they're living, being shut in. They have, they have struggled. So he heard the voice of the Lord. I want you to open up. I want you to conduct your services. And he's not mandating people to wear masks. He's like, look, this is the ordinance. I'm not making you come, but if you want to come, you come. And, and I, I respect Pastor Mike um, McClure for the stance and the position that he is making for the kingdom of God, even though he's being opposed by the natural government. Guess what he's saying? I'm building eternal salvation in people's lives. I'm building for their future, and nothing's going to stop me. Thank God for Pastor Mike. Lord, we pray for Pastor Mike right now. We pray that you strengthen him. God, thank you for the men of God that have rallied around him, that have gone down to offer their support. And I pray for uh, uh, Tyler and Bursch, uh, the lawyers that are representing him. God, give them the wisdom. And I know there's another organization that is helping to support him. Father, give them wisdom and strategy and how to present the case before the judges. And Lord, I pray for victory in Jesus, even in the natural, as it is in the spiritual. They've already won. They have victory. But Lord, let it come to be. Lord, smite the enemy. Smite the attitudes of the Antichrist spirit 
in the Northern California area, area and bring your victory right now to Pastor Mike and his church in Jesus' name. Everybody say amen in Jesus. <laughs> Look that article up. You'll see it. Pray for him, Pastor Mike McClure. So what were the circumstances here? The walls were fallen. The gates were destroyed. It opened up a bunch of, of threat threats to the children of Israel. So I want to point out that Nehemiah started at the Sheep Gate. If you look at the, the, the map up there, you'll see that that's the northern wall, the northern gate. It was, nor it, was, it was located in the northeastern corner of the wall. It was named because the sheep would enter through it to, on their way to the temple. So think about the practicality of how they name things. Oh, that's the gate where the sheep goes in, go into? That's the sheep gate. That's where they bring all the fish in. That's the fish gate. You know, it makes sense, right? So all the sheep, now you got to listen to this. There, there, are some, there are some natural visual things that we're, as we're reading, we're watching the reconstruction, but also there's spiritual application that are associated with each gate that I'd like to draw out and that we can encounter Jesus. We can encounter a spiritual application for our lives and we can continue to grow in our faith with Jesus. Listen to this. So it was near the market where the sheep would come in, where they were sold. They were sold, and they were washed in a pool. It was called the sheep pool. How about that? There's a pool of water. We'll call it the sheep pool. What did they do in the sheep pool? They washed the, the, the sheep to prepare them for sacrifice. Man, I'm telling you, we could go so deep into this. Man. Uh, I'm just thinking about, sorry, Kevin, I'm going to point you out. But I mean, we, we need to talk over this, man, because this is so deep. I mean, this is like a picture of baptism. You know, when you come to the Lord and you're, you're walking through the gate, I'm just going to get ahead. I'm going to just say it. The gate is a representation of Jesus. The gate. I am what? I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And, and, and I'm just going to jump down to read this in, in John chapter 10. Turn in your Bibles really quick. John chapter 10, verse 7. John 10, verse 7. Very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. Oh, he says it loud and clear. I am am the gate for the sheep all who've come before me are thieves and robbers but the sheep have not listened to me i am the gate whoever enters through me will be saved they will come in and go out and find pasture the thief comes only to steal kill and destroy i have come that they may have life and have it to the full what was nehemiah doing by making this gate the first gate to be repaired he says look the first thing you need in life that needs to be repaired is your relationship with God. How do you fix a broken down gate in somebody's life? You turn them to Jesus. Jesus is the gate. He's the only way to the Father. And when you look at this in Nehemiah chapter 3, verse 1, Nehemiah chapter 3, verse 32, the way that this description goes, he goes full circle. He starts with Jesus, and he ends with Jesus. Hallelujah to that, huh? How about this? The gate reminds us of the cross and the sacrifices made for our sins. Everything starts and ends with Jesus' death on the cross. That's where life begins. That's where new life begins, where at least it was reading in Corinthians. Your old life has passed away. The new life begins. See, Christians, we are bought with the price. That's 1 Corinthians 6.20. We're bought with the price. The blood of God's Lamb, Jesus Christ. I love how we're described in the Bible, throughout the Bible and the Gospels. It says that mankind is described in a way of a wayward sheep. You can read that in Isaiah 53.6. We're sheep who need a shepherd to lead us. And we need a, sh a shepherd that knows where we're going. And Jesus is leading us all home, our eternal home. Amen? He's leading us back into eternal eternity with him. Now, this also speaks prophetically of Jesus' coming the first time, but also of Jesus' coming the second time. Everything begins and ends with Jesus. So where can we apply Nehemiah 3 into our life today? So can I help you? This morning, I would like to offer you a, a message 
We're going to stop at this gate right really quick here. I'd like to offer you a message of hope. I would like to bring your mindset into something that you probably already heard and you probably already know. But I think it's time that we remind you, we remind, the Holy Spirit's reminding us of, of this gate of importance called the Sheep Gate. How do we apply this? Look, in real life, we're often faced with different doors of choices every single day, right? You have a door of, a, of choices every single day laid before you. Some of these may lead you to a better life in the future, while others can lead to failure, defeat, or even death. You know, one bad decision, you could end your life. One bad decision could, could mean life or death. And we read in John chapter 10, verse 7, uh, down to verse 10, you know, Jesus refers to himself as the door of the sheep. And this is sometimes translated as the gate of the sheep. You can read that through different translations in your Bibles. So when you look at chapter 10 and you look at the whole chapter, chapter 10, 1 through 21, it uses this metaphor of a door and of a gate, of gaining access to something else. And the idea of Jesus as the good shepherd watching over us. And I, and I love the metaphors of the Bible. I love how everything just kind of builds toward the image of Jesus. And that's what I believe we're going to do here this morning. So what does Jesus mean by this? And, and how can we take the truth of John 10, 7 through 10, and how can we apply it into our lives today? So why did Jesus suddenly start talking about himself as the door of the sheep and using this kind of metaphor? What we, what we have to do is we have to look at John chapter 9 and John chapter 10 together because it's the same setting so what was happening in john chapter 9 go home and read it those of you at home just mark that down go back and read it later but i want to paraphrase par paraphrase this see this is where jesus had healed a man who had been born blind and jesus spit on the ground and he made this paste of mud and he put it on the this man's eyes and he rubbed it in and what what did he say go wash in the pool of, of uh, salome and when he did when the man went and washed, he was able, once the, the mud was washed off, he was able to see. And so naturally, what happens when a miracle happens in your life? Hey, look, I used to have this pain in my arm. I have no pain anymore, right? I used to have a pain in my leg. I don't, you want to tell somebody of this mir miracle that took place in your life. And so here's what happened. He went out and he started telling people, and not everybody was happy with his testimony. That's pretty crazy to me. I don't know about you, but I would feel excited. I would, be, I would be pumped up to hear if somebody got out of that wheelchair and started walking. Somebody got up out of that hospital bed and, and started walking. Somebody who was walking with a blind stick, and they, their eyes, I would be excited no matter what day it was. But these people, the religious people, they became very skeptical. They wondered, is this the same guy? Is this the same man? Who is this? But the crazy thing is, is they began to ridicule Jesus, and they began to come against him, and they began to tell him, how dare you break the law? You, you're, you're healing somebody on the Sabbath? What is that about? Does anybody understand why they would have such an attitude with God himself, with Jesus? You know, this is interesting. They didn't stop at questioning the guy. They're like, hey, we're going to call your parents over here. And we're going to grill them with questions. We're going to begin to ask them to identify, is this your son? And was he really blind? You know, so the Pharisees looked at this at a, as a very legalistic thing that Jesus was doing by breaking the Sabbath and healing the blind man on that day. It was a day that no work was supposed to be done. So the healing was, to them, a breaking of the law of God. So after arguing with the man for a little while, they eventually put him out of the synagogue. And in their eyes, the, the blind man, who was the former blind man, you know, they're like, he couldn't have experienced God. You know, he, he wasn't healed the proper way. He, there was this expectation that he had to do these fundamental things to encounter God. And I just started looking at all this. I'm like, man, we are no different if we have a religious spirit about us. Every new thing that comes, everything that's new that's coming, that God wants to bring fresh and anew, we got to be careful that we don't cross our arms and say, mm -mm, that's not the way we do it here at New Hope Family Church, Pastor Moody. That's not the way we do it, God. That's not the way that we've done it for the last decade, two decades, five decades in the existence of whatever church that you're a part of. That's not the way we do it here in the United States of America. 
Look, we need to maintain an open heart to the leading of the Lord in season. In season. Right here, right now. What is God doing? And how is he doing it? And this is how you can tell. It takes a surrendered heart. It takes a willingness of your heart to connect with his heart. How do we identify, and this is going to be important in the days to come, how do we identify the works of God in a city, in a church, in somebody's life? This is how you do it. But you just recognize the fruit. You recognize the fruit of the miracle, the fruit of a, a conversion of somebody's life. You recognize this is God's hand at work. Listen, this is the time for us not to fall into, you know, traditions and mindsets. It's time to come out of those to find the will of God for our church right here, right now, for your life right here, right now. The healing couldn't be valid? Yes, it was valid. Yes, it was valid. It was the way of God for right then and right now in that man's life. See, what they were trying to do, and I, I caught this through my study, what they were really trying to do is that they were trying to be the door of God themselves. Think about that. They were trying to be the door. You can't do it that way. That's not the way we do it. Jesus, he just said, look, I, I'm having enough of this. So you go into chapter 10, and he's like, let me break this down for you guys. I am the door of the sheep. I am the gate. Not you. It's me. So why does Jesus use this imagery of the door of the sheep. So if you look at looked at the walls of Jerusalem and how they were made, they were made with stone and they were made with wooden pillars and gates. And that's what Nehemiah was doing. He was going to fix the wall, the perimeter. It was like 220 acres of wall that, you know, was erected. And they had to fix different sections of the wall that were breached and broken down. But think about this. Inside the walls, they were these sheep pens or, or and near the, 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 the city of Jerusalem, there were these sheep pens. And, and the sheep pen was built, wasn't very high. It was, it was high enough where the sheep wouldn't jump out. But there were four walls, but in one of the walls, there was a little opening. There was a little opening. The opening was just big enough for the shepherd himself to sit down right in the middle of that opening. So guess what the sheep, the, the, the sheep, um, I was going to say the, the sheep herder, <laughs> The, the, the shepherd would do. So how many of you know that shepherds carried a staff, right? They carried a staff. Sometimes that staff had a little hook on the end. And what did he do? He would guide the, the sheep in through the gate into the sheep pen. That's one. That's two. He counted them all. They were his sheep. He knew them. I don't know if he gave them a name, but I'm sure he knew each one of them by color, by markings or whatever. And there it was. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. That's not normal on that one. Let me hold on there. There's an injury right there to that one. There's a wound. I'm going to fix the wound. He'd get his anointing oil. He would pour it on. He would clean up that, that sheep, and then he would let it into the sheep pen. Why was it important that he not let an untreated wound into the sheep pen? So that way other sheep wouldn't become infected by a wounded sheep. See, the shepherd had a very important role. He was caring for every single sheep that would come into the sheep pen. And after all the sheep were in, get this, he would sit back down right between the two openings in that wall with his staff, and he himself would make himself the gate. He was the gate. It wasn't a, a wooden gate or a gate of stone. He, the shepherd, was guarding that opening into the sheep pen. He was the gate. So when we read this again, the story that we've been reading since we were little children in children's church, that he is the gate. He is the shepherd. Jesus was the one. He was himself allowing things to come in and keeping things from going out. Think about this. The shepherd had a job to maintain the health and the welfare of every single sheep. So when one would get out, how it got out, uh, maybe he, I don't know, maybe he just miscounted and there was one out. Whoa, 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 whoa. I'm missing one. Let me go find the one. That's the care of the shepherd. He was so involved with the sheep, caring for the sheep. Even this, how many of you know that there were wolves? How many of you know that wolves like to eat sheep? They prey on the sheep, right? So get this. The shepherd would use his rod 
to keep the wolves away. When a, when a wolf would come and attack just one sheep, what would he do? He would risk his life. There's a portion there that talks about how the hireling, a hireling is somebody who is hired by the, the, the owner of the sheep. The, the chief shepherd, the owner, would hire these men or women, these men mostly, to take care of the sheep. So get this, get this. Whenever a threat would come against the sheep and a wolf, how many you know wolves are very vicious? They could be very dangerous. And if you get in the way of a wolf, listen, you're going to become lunch. <laughs> you're going to become the prey. And so what, what happened is the hireling, the hired servant would run away. He's like, that ain't my sheep. That's your sheep. I'm out, Jack. <laughs> I'm not going to encounter this, this wolf. I'm not going to risk my life. But here's the difference. The shepherd was like, hang on, not on my watch. Mm, not on my watch. That is my sheep. I'm going to protect that sheep to the laying down of my life, and I will stand between you and that enemy that is out to kill you. And the shepherd would take his rod and would fight that sheep and would scare that sheep off. And I'm sure he killed a few of those. I'm excuse me, this is the wolf. <laughs> He would stand between the, the sheep and the wolf, and he would scare that wolf off, wolf off and, or kill it. And I just saw the, 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 the compassion of the Lord and the love of the Lord for us, that he was willing to give his life, to stand in the gap, to fight between heaven and hell, to say, away from you, devil. I have come to destroy your works. That is my sheep. They belong with me in my sheep pen in glory in heaven. Wow, that's a... Hey, you can clap. That's all right. That's the gospel. That's the truth of the gospel and the power of the gospel. So do you get the imagery of what Jesus is doing? Do you get that he's like painting a picture for these people to relate? Because as they walked around the countryside, and we live in the countryside, go out to the, to the hills. You'll see sheep out there. You ever see those driving along the road like, oh, look at that sheep. You know, stay on the road. You know, hands on the wheel, eyes on the road. But you're like, I get I get. Sidetrack. I look with my wife and I'm like, hey, look at all those sheep. Look at all those sheep out there. And like, I'll just, just, I'm, I'm just in awe of that. Because why? I'm kind of conditioned to the, the gospel. And I want to see what it really looks like in real life. And God uses these analogies and these metaphors to speak deeply to us. So what is he saying overall? What is God speaking to us this morning? There are three implications that the passage here in John chapter 10 can bring to light in our lives. And I want to point some things out really quick as we close. So there are three main things that I want to focus on. Three eyes. So the first one is idols. So here's the question. What kind of doors are we seeking instead of the door Jesus? What kind of things are we putting in our life that are false representations of the true door? Was it football, sports? Is it money? Is it success? Is it fashion? I was telling a story earlier. We celebrated Victoria's birthday. She turned 17. Can you believe that? I have a 17-year-old. My baby's 17. That's crazy. It goes fast. So we're out celebrating, and, uh, and, and we went into the mall, and they were looking around, and then, you know, my, the girls and I, we just kind of went and started looking at these dresses. And on the way home, I'm thinking, I'm like, what is so appealing about things like what is it what's appealing what's the appeal of walking through them all what is the appeal of this thing and we're looking at this dress i'm like what's so appealing about that dress it has one arm one arm it was a one-armed dress and i'm standing there thinking like i don't i don't get it i don't get it it was a nice color it was a nice texture like, what's so appealing about it? And they're like, Dad, it's the fashion. It's fashion, right? It's the style. It's the style. Like, in the car, like, okay, well, it's style is appealing. Okay, what looks good, it's appealing to the eye. Okay, I'm getting it. I got it. I got it. But a one-armed dress, you're missing it. Like, was the seamstress in a hurry? Like, was she on a deadline? She's like, I'm done. I got, I got to turn it in. Got to, you got one arm, and now every, every woman's walking around with, like, one-armed dresses? I don't know. <laughs> you, you just hear, hear this. What are we putting in the place of God in our life? What is so appealing to us that we are, are seeking that thing, that thing instead of Jesus, the real thing? 
What idols have you erected in your life at that entry point, at that gate? What, what is standing there? For some of us, it isn't Jesus right now. For some of us, maybe it's a, 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 a man. I'm thinking a woman. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's your job. Maybe it's money. Maybe it's something pleasurable. But it's not Jesus. God has called us in over seven months to say, look, I want to be the door and the gate of America. I want to be the door and the gate, gate of New Hope Family Church. I want to be the door and the gate in your life. Let's let him do that, church. Let's be the people that do that. Number two is this. There's an imp impediment, impediment, as we can look at an implication. This is one of the things I ask the question. Are there any ways in which we are trying to be a door for someone else and blocking their path? Are there any ways in which we are trying to be a door for someone else and blocking their path? I'm going to tell a quick story I didn't tell in the first service, so you get it. Here we go. When I was younger, I was on fire for Jesus. I wanted everybody to know that he loved them and he wanted to be their savior. And I had a friend, and I would witness to this guy. I worked at Save Mart. Uh, when Save Mart was here in town, I would witness to him, share the love of God. I was befriending him. I would tell him about Jesus. One day, he was in the break room, and I'm sure he saw me coming. He's like, oh, man, I timed my break wrong, right? So here I am, and I wasn't being overbearing. I was just, I'm a happy-go-lucky guy. I'm easygoing, and I sat down. And I started to share with him. It was just conversation. We just came into the conversation. And he looked at me and he said, Louie, you can't save me. Whack, right? Boom. Drop the mic. And I looked at him and I'm like, you're absolutely right. I can't save you, but Jesus can. <laughs> I mean, come on. I, I mean, I, I, it, was, it was a, for me, as an 18-year-old, High, uh, newly graduated high school student and future, you know, minister, I, I'm learning, I'm learning this. And, and it impacted me because God reminded me, look, no, you can't save one soul. You can't, but I can. It's your job just to, to be the presenter of it, you know, but I, I don't want you to be a stumbling block or an impediment to my work in their life. You got to hear this. So some of us are really praying for our loved ones. Some of us are trying to stand in the gap, but you're not God. All our job is to do is to pray them into God's kingdom, to deliver words of encouragement, words of love, words of grace. Some of them are stern words sometimes. That's love. That's love. Love can be stern. Love can be direct. But let's not get in the way of the working of God and that miracle of salvation in their life. But I'll tell you something, and I didn't say this to the first service. I'm going to tell you too. This is the danger as a Christian. Hey, you know what? You know how many people I've led to the Lord this year? You know how many people that I've encountered and I have led them to Jesus? You know how many people I have saved this year? See, the, see a religious spirit can kind of get in the way. A religious spirit can come, and you can literally be a blocking point for the grace of God or the, the blessings of God even to come into your life. But here, here's the challenge with this. I started looking at this. What, what's going on here is we can do things in our own strength and inadvertently believe we're believing that is our own effort or our own, uh, uh, what would you call that, that our own charisma. And we're, we're, we're leading people and we're directing people because of the good thing that I'm doing. Eh, wrong. Wrong. See, look, you're called to a life of, of, of service in Christ. That service in your job and service in his kingdom to build his kingdom. Remember I said earlier, you're at right now in your job. God has led you to that job. Or even if you're not working like my wife, God has led her to be the homemaker of our home. She's got an important role. Sometimes I'm looking and I was like, man, that's even more important than what I'm doing right now. She's like setting the atmosphere. In fact, they're doing that conference like to teach women. Look, it's not just about setting up decorations in your house. It's making your house a home, an environment for the Holy Spirit to access every one of you in that house, your children and your husband. That's, that's an awesome thing. Every season of our life, God's bringing us to, and he's saying, look, it's not about you. Remember we say this, I say this to my wife, like a happy wife, a happy life, right? She's like, she, she, doesn't, she can't stand that. She's like, no, no, don't put me in that category. No, uh -uh. 
I'm going to tolerate that. No. A happy life in Jesus. You know, we're all together in Christ. We'll build our family in Him. Not on my happiness. Not on my contentment. This woman right here. Not me. Her. You know, she. Not her. <laughs> not her. She's like, no, not my contentment. No, our contentment is with Him. In Him. Don't be... The, so don't be the, the stumbling block or the impediment, the, the thing that blocks them to receive all from God. And it happens, it happens because of what we think that we're doing is so good. Listen, we can't be someone's door to salvation. We can't make other people turn from their wickedness. It's not a preacher up here. It's not a fancy word of God that you get on the internet. This is dangerous. I'm telling you, we're in dangerous times. We're in dangerous times. And I'm going to say this. I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it. We are so conditioned that when we're going through a hard time, that we open up our phone and that we find a sermon preached by the most popular preacher that we love and that we want to hear what he has to say about our situation. I'm not saying that's wrong altogether because I listen to sermons like that. But I'll tell you what can happen. That could be a stumbling block to you this way. Why don't you close your door? Get on your knees, get on your face, and open up the Word of God directly to you. Well, I don't understand it, Pastor. Look, sometimes we may not understand everything, but when you have an open heart and open spirit, and God is, God is leading you to that encounter, He wants to encounter you. He doesn't want to encounter somebody else's, you know, words. And I'm, I'll be the first preacher to say it. I don't know if I am, but, but listen, I'd rather you listen to the Word of God than listen to... 10,000 words that I speak. I pray that the words I speak inspire, encourage, and lead you, as Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Follow me as I'm committed to Christ. Don't do the stuff that I'm, you know, in my tradition, in my, in my mindset. No, I pray that it's all about God's word. I'm pointing you toward the word of God. Find it for yourself. Do not block somebody, somebody's access to God. Let's allow God to, to be that access point. For them. Amen. The last one is this, an invitation. Invitation. Here's the question. How and why is Jesus the only door through which we can enter? Verse 9 in John chapter 10 says, says, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. So let's think about this in just a minute, for just a minute. Jesus says, if anyone, if anyone would enter by me, See, here's the, here's the invitation. The invitation goes out to all of us. It's an invitation to all. Jesus is inviting everyone, even the Pharisees in this passage. However, the Pharisees, they miss who he is. They don't see him for who he is. As he's inviting him in, and them in, they miss him. They miss him. I don't want to be a church that misses the shepherd. I don't want to mi miss the gate. I don't want to miss this opportunity in the time of history that we can bring all of our ministry focus, not on what we're doing to make a name for ourselves, but bringing it back to the chief shepherd, to the gate that the attention needs to be put on. See, Jesus is available for all. See, they were unable to see the door in front of them. Even though they have been accusing the man who was born blind and, and, and of being in sin, even though the light of the world shines in front of them, they still remain spiritually blind. I don't want to be a spiritually blind pastor. I don't want to lead a spiritually blind people. But here's the question. How many times, how many times do we try to experience life in all of its, its fullness, in all of its glory, but we are doing it on our own apart from Jesus? How many times are we trying to find pasture on our own? How many times are we trying to find satisfaction in something that we think is bring, bringing happiness and joy into our life? Listen, today's the day. Today's the time that Jesus is welcoming, welcoming in a, us in. And we'll come in and we'll go out and we'll find pasture in his purpose. Amen. This is the day right now that we need to remember God is rebuilding the sheep gate at New Hope Family Church. God is rebuilding the sheep gate in the United States of America. God is rebuilding the sheep gates in our own personal lives and in our homes. Will you let him and will you join the work that he's calling us to do together? Amen. Will you stand to your feet? Will you stand to your feet this afternoon?
Hallelujah. Lord, I thank you for this time that we have together that we could consider what your word speaks to us beyond just the understanding of the words that we read as a story. Lord, you bring that depth of revelation. And I had this picture of an iceberg and at the tip of the iceberg, you could see the tip of the iceberg, but there's so much more that lies below. The iceberg is so much bigger that it's deeper into the ocean. And Father, this morning, we want to dive deeper into the meaning of what it means to rebuild the gates around our lives. What are you speaking to us? And number one, salvation. Jesus, everything begins and ends with you. Everything begins and ends with the cross. And so this morning, we want to speak this word out for those that are watching at home, those that are here with us. Let's be reminded of where we need to be in our relationship with Jesus, number one. If we've been living on our own, doing our own thing, trying to do things in our own power, in our own strength, today's the day that we re realign ourselves. Today's the day that we begin to close out this year, 2020, and begin afresh and anew in 2021. Today's the day that we align ourselves with repentance and we say, God, we're sorry. God, forgive us of our selfishness. Forgive us of the sin that we've allowed in our life. Forgive us of those things that we have erected as idols and those things that have that tried to come and pollute us. Lord, forgive us for looking at that and giving our attention to that. And Lord, will you just renew our minds? Will you renew our eyes? Will you open up our eyes? Will you give us a new set of eyes? Will you clean our spiritual eyes, God? I'm asking, Lord, that you do that for us. And Father, we don't, we don't stay down in um, the mentality and the grief of our sin. Lord, we rise up knowing that we're forgiven of our sin. Any area that we disobeyed you, Lord, you clean us off and you bring us back into that sheep pen. You, you, you clean us up so that we won't get infected with sin in our life. And Lord, you have a better way for us. That's to find pasture with you, to be content in the life that you're causing us to live. And Father, I thank you. I thank you, Lord, that we're not gonna be a stumbling block we're not going to be a hindrance, Lord, in someone's life, even our own personal lives, God. We're not going to take the credit. We're going to look to you as the Savior of the world, the Savior of our family, the Savior of our coworkers. Lord, we're going to give you all the glory. We're going to give you all the honor, and we're going to give you all the praise. Lord, you're the only one that can save our souls. You're the only one that can save our family. And Father, I just pray that this invitation, it's an invitation to all of us to join you in your work, your kingdom come, your will be done in our life as it is in heaven. Your will be done in my family, your will be done in this church, in this city, in this state, in this nation, all over the world. Let your will be done. Lord, that invitation is for all. And Father, right now we choose you. We choose you and we say yes to you. Come on, in your own personal way, will you just choose him? Will you just tell him, Lord, I just lay down those idols. I just lay down any stumbling block in my life. Even if, I, if I'm the stumbling block, I just humble myself. And Lord, I just pray that I would be an invitation. I would receive that invitation to join you in your work. Thank you, Lord, for leading us and guiding us and directing us. And I just know that even though there may not be anybody here, there may be some people watching, I just want to give this invitation. If you don't know Jesus and you would like to know Jesus and you want to give him your heart, you want to open up your heart to him, and you want to step into a life and a relationship with him, today's that day, and all you have to do is say this simple prayer, I'm going to ask everybody to pray this that's here with us, say this prayer with me, say, dear Lord Jesus, I open wide the door of my heart, and I ask you to come in, be my Lord, and be my Savior, be the shepherd of my life, I give you my everything, thank you for forgiving me, Thank you for giving me new life in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. A simple prayer, first step, first step. Keep coming. Keep fellowshipping. We're getting ready to do some new things at New Hope going into the, the beginning of next year. I'm looking for a, a model shift, a directional shift, and I'm praying that no wolf is going to take any one of us out. Amen. We're going to be protected by our chief shepherd, Jesus. I pray a blessing upon you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. May you find pasture in him this evening, this uh, rest of the week. In Jesus' name, amen.
hey, I'll see you on Wednesday. I do need some help in here on Wednesday, on our Wednesday night live. After we do our little devotional prayer, we're going to clean out the sanctuary, stack up the chairs, and we're going to make this ready for the women's meeting next Saturday, November 7th at 945, 8.45, 8.45. you got to sign up, see my wife. If you haven't signed up, she'll get you signed up. All right, God bless you. We love you. We'll see you next week, 9 and 11, right here, or Wednesday at 7. God bless. Bye-bye.